Greetings everyone, this is Hogan Works, and uh, today we're going to go through and um, cut out and model up some Tyranid Hive Guards, but we're also going to go over some of the tips and tricks I have to share with you today while I do it. Um, so as I said, these are the Tyranid Hive Guard here. Pull them right out of the box. And these new Games Workshop Classics are, I have to admit, um, are really great because the last time that I was really an avid Games Workshop modeler was about 20 some years ago. That's right. Um, I played in uh, essentially versions 1, 2, and 3 of the Warhammer 40k universe and then jumped ahead to, I think, uh, 8 is what we're currently at. So these are the current um, Hive Guard. These are actually new. They're not the same as the Tyrant Guard, even though they share a pretty similar name. And um, they're pretty cool. These ones essentially give you some really tremendous firepower to utilize with your army. Um, and I've been looking forward to these for quite a while. So, set those aside. Instructions here. And pull out the bases. Like that. And then before I go through and build a model, I always try and take a minute to... Um, look through the instructions and just see if there's any gotchas and so forth. So this actually, I didn't realize this, um, but it makes sense. This kit also does build the Tyrant Guard as well as the Hive Guard Warriors with their nice um, guns up here. So we'll look that up in a second exactly what they do. Actually, let's go right back. There's the new instructions print the rules, although, well, not this one. I'll have to grab the book here and uh, we'll take a look. Okay, so we're back with the Codex here for Tyranids. I love the New Games Workshop Codices too. When I was a kid, um, these were nice thick books with huge amounts of stories in them. And in one of the middle versions of the game, they became these very small pamphlets just with the rules, and uh, it was very unfortunate. Um, although Games Workshop has no trouble getting money out of me, I definitely am happy to pay uh, extra for these nice books. So, I believe that these are elites, so let's go see Hiveguard, right there. Alright, so what we're looking at here, um, unit 3 base for 7 power, 5 inch movement, 4 plus weapon skill, 3 plus ballistic skill, strength 4, toughness 5, 3 wounds, 2 attacks, not bad, save 4 plus. Um, so they can have the impaler cannons or the shock cannons. Impaler cannons give you a bit more range, 36 inches, heavy 2, strength 8, minus 2 AP and D3 wounds and can be fired without line of sight. That is pretty hot, I have to admit. Um, the other ones, the shock cannons, you lose the out of line of sight, you lose a full foot of range, a little bit of strength and AP, um, but they do extra damage to vehicles. But uh, I think for mine, um, I've definitely been going with the impaler cannons there. So. Skipping ahead here to the, let's see, the main body sections, which should be the same for all of them. Yep, and then we can scroll through here. And the first one is going to be the hive guard. Alright. That's the impaler cannon. That's the shot cannon. Pretty simple. Alright, so we'll just uh, start out there in the beginning here. I was trying to arrange my workspace so that I've got everything kind of laid out in a place that uh, makes it easy for me to get the information I'm looking for. Um, one thing too uh, I want to mention, kind of a first little tip, is uh, I recently sprung for a pair of Citadel's uh, sprue nippers here, these kind of um, zero clearance uh, nippers. And um, they were very expensive. They were $32 American, I believe, um, which is a pretty penny, but they are very comfortable, very solid. Um, I actually like them quite a bit. Um, you definitely could get away with some um, close nippers from another brand of variety you like. And um, 
maybe we get down through here, we'll talk about uh, sharpening these uh, if we need to. So, I always like that. And I'll go in here and I'll figure out. The setup is three independent units. They look like it. All right. So we can just start with the first one here. Um, the glue that I prefer to use uh, right now is, of course, is Citadel's plastic glue. Um, this is the type of super glue where it will actually melt and weld plastic together, uh, which is fantastic. Um, it sets up very quickly. For the most part, you could kind of jam it together, give it a second, and it's ready to go, um, within reason, of course. Um, it is still a little fragile and wet, but once it dries, it's essentially one solid piece. Um, so that's pretty good stuff. I will recommend, however, though, that if you have any of the resin models, and let me grab one here, if you have any of the resin models, like this uh, Drukhari Mandrake, um, those glues don't work, um, or at least they don't work for me, uh, as it's not the same kind of material. You require a more traditional cyanoacrylate um, super glue, um, which there are a lot of different kinds. Um, this is the first one that I picked up. And then I went through and uh, ordered some that I used um, when I was a kid, which is also good. But you can see it's it's just a cyanoacrylate. This is the stuff where if you get it on your fingers, you can glue your fingers together, and it will glue your skin together incredibly quickly. Um, if your lungs are quick, you can pull them back apart, but uh, it's definitely something to be careful of. And um, when it comes to gluing, say, things like these resin models or, you know, these rare um, pewter models that you can still get, like this is the Phoenix, parts of the Phoenix Lord, James R. Um, <coughs> pardon me. I have our non-assembled, I uh, recently picked up an airbrush, and so I'm going to be doing some lights and shadows on there, and I uh, decided to to leave her limbs off. A lot of painters who are uh, miniature modelers, who are much more experienced than I am, um, tend to do them this way, and then they'll use something like uh, a cork. So if you're a wine drinker and you happen to keep these, to stick these in, and then they'll use that. She's a little heavy for this because she's pretty much solid with this big mane of hair. Um, but this, as well, uh, benefits from having a traditional uh, sign acrylate. Now, if you're going to be using that for the love of Pete, um, get yourself some accelerant instant set for cyanoacrylic glues. Um, this will save your sanity. Instead of having to use, you know, some helping hands like this guy or some strange balancing act, you can basically put the glue on one side of the model and spray the other side that you're going to be gluing it to with this accelerant, jam them together, give them a couple seconds, and it will uh, kind of do a preliminary instant harden on that glue. Um, maybe we'll set up a little demonstration here if I can find a... There we go. You can see a, a spare piece of cardboard right here. We'll use the dark side. So I'll just use this cyanoacrylate right here, and uh, maybe we'll do a control, but i got to give it some space because they're a little far away. What I'll do is I'll take the accelerant here, and I'll see if I can't get it in the position that's easier to see with this camera, and I'll just give uh, the one over here a quick spray. And you should be able to see up there, see the surface ripple? That is the accelerant going through, and you can see on the one over here, um, it's still very smooth and wet, whereas this one over here, um, it has this kind of ripple effect, and it's, it's really just the top layer. Um, it's meant to kind of help you get it set. Like if I, you know, move this around, you can kind of see it's still liquid on the inside. If I push on it, um, there's still some liquid glue. But it definitely is a lifesaver. It does speed up the process. It is fantastic. The other way. Um, I'll also make a little safety tip here uh, with X-Acto blades because you will um, you know, need a decent X-Acto blade. I believe these are just number threes or elevens. Elevens. Number elevens blades. Um, to clean up the plastic on the sprues from the plastic models and especially the resin models. The resin models come as kind of a nightmare of um, sprues and artifacts and melted pieces, um, and they are really in need of uh, a lot of extra work. And not only with those little extra sprues and stuff, but yeah, my camera set to. There's also little artifacts. Um, I don't know if you can see it on the camera here. There's this little triangle of extra material right there at the end of my finger that you have to cut off. Um, 
I really, you know, I think it's really great that Games Workshop has so much faith in me as a miniature modder, modeler. Um, although I'm a software engineer, uh, I guess it's uh, part of our responsibility to get these cleaned up. Um, they are beautiful models. They are really nice. Um, Games Workshop does print out and produce some of the best ones out there, but uh, be careful on those, especially in any regards with uh, your X-Acto knife. Um, currently, I'm using these new generation blades. Here, these Exacto Z series. Um, they have a little gold tint to them. I'm not sure what the main difference is. I believe if you look at it, there's actually a double bevel on there. Uh, if you do any sharpening, say, of like chisels or planes for wood, one of the techniques that they'll have on there that you can do is you'll, you'll you know, do that first um, uh, sharpen on there, and then you'll actually go through with a little bit of a one degree or the thickness of a pencil lead and you'll do a quick secondary bevel to help it cut. Um, and that does seem to, to be what's going on here, although so far I haven't been terribly impressed with them on this plastic. Um, it might just be this material. Uh, I'm going to work with it a little bit more. Um, but uh, follow proper uh, knife safety on these. Um, it was on this mandrake, especially right here. I was cleaning up the uh, material underneath, and... Um, in a position where I thought there was going to be a lot more resistance, there wasn't, and I came right across that thumb right there, and through the nail bed, and the nail, uh, it was a very sharp knife, thankfully, and uh, really caused myself a little bit of strain there for a while, so uh, definitely be careful with those, and definitely always work with the sharpest ones you can, so that you are not putting a lot of pressure on them. If you find that you are pushing really hard on the blade, just stop. Um, place the miniature on a flat surface and carve away from you. Um, do anything you can to remove that. A lot of times, you know, we do cut towards a thumb. You want to kind of offset your thumb so that it's on a lower piece. Um, and just be insanely careful because, you know, it happens. Um, so let's get back to this now. So the first thing I'm going to do here is uh, we have some matched body parts. So I'll grab my nippers. We've got one and we have two. And I'll just go in here with these nippers. And what I try and do is I put the flat surface of the nipper back uh, on this side here against the model, against the side that I want to keep. And then I try and angle the nipper so it matches the plastic, the angle of the model, and then I'll cut along each of those. Now with Tyrannus, of course, these are very organic, so you're going to be doing some work no matter what. Um, but on other types of models, you will find that that will help just a little bit uh, to remove the, uh, to reduce the amount of that flashing that you have to do. Um, so I have my two halves of my body part there. And then we have legs, which what I've noticed in these new sprues from Citadel or from Games Workshop um, is that they will lay out the parts that match on the same sprue, which is really great. So you aren't hunting for eight and seven and there's six legs in one area here when you have these matched sets. In fact, right here I've got seven and eight. So I'll go ahead and just clip those out. And I tend to clip out all the sides. Um, I used to be lazy, just clip out a couple and just work it and break off that piece. Uh, but that can really injure your model um, and just give you more work to try and clean it up. So let me make out a couple more pieces here. And then um, we'll work on that. And what I usually do is I'll build one model first to see how they go together, and then I'll go through and actually um, do more of a production line where I may do, you know, all the legs for a group of soldiers, or I'll do all the body parts and make neat piles out of them and put them assembled that way. But the first time I usually do just one. And then we'll grab a, uh, a head here, and they are two-sided. And we'll just grab the head that's on there, right there. And we'll scooch ahead to the next page, which is just assembling those pieces that we cut out. All right, so we'll set that aside for now. Got our body, got our legs, got our head, and I'll take my knife. And uh, once again here, what I'm looking for are little pieces of plastic, like you can see right there. They're leftovers from uh, the sprue being cut. And these ones, they are very small because of those nippers, um, but you definitely you know, need to come back through and get those cleaned up. For something like this, um, I'll probably position my hand, as you can see, I'm trying to put my thumb below the plane of the knife, 
That way I don't cut my other thumb in half. Ha -ha. Um, and then I'll just try and lay the blade onto that surface and very lightly take small bites until I get that piece off. Same with this one here. In fact, with this one, there's a nice angle where I've actually laid my blade um, onto this angle. And I'll just kind of come across. And once it's down here, I have my thumb behind the blade. So I'm going to kind of move up and just very lightly take those pieces off there. And I've got one more set on here, like that. And then I will repeat this process. And for something that's a bit more difficult, like this part of the rib cage right here, um, you are going to have to be a little careful because you don't want to flatten those pieces out, uh, which is what I just did. So don't don't do what I did. Just just do what I say, or go along with what I say. Don't do what I say. Clean this one up, and finally, I'll clean this one up. Okay. Move over the legs here while I shed bandage wrappings. I guess it's cutting pretty well right now, so I may have um, I may have uh, underestimated these new Exacto blades. Um, the next question, of course, is you know whether there's a significant difference from the regular blades and uh, a significant difference in price, which I actually don't remember, unfortunately. Now this round spot on the back of his head um, is going to be see I, I hit my finger right there, so I'm going to want to you know, in that case, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to lay it on a flat surface. And I'm going to angle my blade where I want that cut away from me. And just get that piece off. And when you have a rounded area, there's a couple different techniques you can try. Um, I've seen people use thin, flexible standing sticks. I usually use one of these foam sanders. Um, and I got this from Home Depot. Um, this one, I think, is a 320, so it's fairly smooth cutting. And what I'm going to do is just um, take that little part of that round section and very lightly just sand around it until I get it where I want it. Not too much because you can really alter these shapes um, very quickly. All right, so now those pieces are done. I'll move my knife and my nippers out of the way. Grab my super glue. One thing I do like about these um, uh, Citadel glues, too, is that the applicator is um, metal, which, of course, we talked about this particular glue only. You know, like, I've got it on my fingers, but, you know, they're not, they're not sticking at all. Um, but this metal um, applicator is really nice because um, you can take it out and clean it. Um, and you can also, when the glue gets low, l pull it out to its very limit. And then when you pour the glue down, um, you'll actually can get, like, the last little remnants out of the bottle. Um, as far as cleaning these, um, I use a little just medical syringe. Um, I have diabetes, so of course I, I have some extra laying around. Um, and uh, you can use a pin or a very small sewing needle to clean out the edges. Um, my local hobby shop owner actually would pull this out of the glue first, please do that, pull it out of the glue first, and would use a lighter and would you know, describe it as like a little blowtorch coming out of both ends. And that was certainly not my experience. Um, I unfortunately was not wearing my sign and uh, held this and put a lighter to it and burnt my fingers immediately. And uh, so I didn't really get much out of that technique. On top of that, this glue is very flammable, so it's just, you know, be careful. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at these two pieces and uh, I will actually uh, dry fit them together because I, what I want to see is the plane, the pieces of the plate that where they touch so that I know where to put my glue and there's actually a little bit of a an inlet on that side so what I'm going to do is actually just follow this little curved line all the way around the inside and then the overlap on the sternum there and then I will pop those together and another little trick um, go to Home Depot or your local hardware store and get a handful of these things. They're usually about 15 cents. They're not very strong, which is perfect for these plastics, but you can put things together that even though it's a good glue, sometimes the seams um, flex or they move a little bit. And if you want to get a nice tight seam, you can just clamp that on and leave it. 
and then you can move it around. And one thing too to be careful with this glue, because it's so effective with welding um, plastic, if you get some on your finger and you touch the model, you'll leave these indelible fingerprints in the plastic or you'll smear some of the detail. So just a little bit more kind of glue hygiene uh, to be careful of that. So we'll set him there. Um, oh, I didn't cut his tail out. Let's oh, see, I already forgot something here. So let's grab his tail there. And once I have angled my, because um, I'm right-handed, I tend to put the flat side of the nippers over here. I tend to move the plastic and then not move these. That way I just get a bit more control over it. All right, so we'll go back to our X-Acto. Got a bit of a round spot here, but it's going to be inside of his body. So I'm not too worried about it. And then there's one over here. Very light little cuts. Now, if you get one of these, and this happens a lot, just the part of the process, you'll get a line down an organic shape from where the molds came together. Turn your blade backwards and then lightly drag it back across that line. And you'll see I'll get these little tiny, and let me clear this off so you can I'll just throw it on the floor. An integral part of your kit for um, you know, being a miniature modeler is to have a flashlight or your cell phone next to your desk because you'll drop these tiny pieces on your floor or in your lap and on your carpet when it's dark and you can't see anything and you need a flashlight to go hunt the little bastards down. So I'll go back to the bottom of this tail here and once again I'm turning the blade the opposite way I'm pulling it and I will just scrape along there and then you can see on my blade there's these little tiny shavings and uh, we're ready to go. All right. Now that we have his tail set up, we can do his legs. So let me just do a dry fit. In this particular case, these are actually uh, a shaped pin to go into a shaped socket. Um, so it's really about just finding the angle that those are meant to sit in and that they have the least gaps when you look at it from different angles. And I'll just put a nice dollop of glue in that slot and slide this around again just to make sure it's getting in the right position. Give it a little bit of pressure. This one's going to be a little loose. Sometimes I'll do... Let's see. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll actually, with this particular weld, is I'll move the piece back and forth to kind of push it into that newly melted plastic um, and kind of just cement that seam. And that looks like about the right angle. Um, and I can go on the next side here. And just do the same thing. And we'll just move that around until we get the proper positioning somehow. All right, and that looks good until we stand up. Let's just go ahead and make sure we can shift a little bit. And he's going to be glued down anyways, but it's nice to know that their step uh, looks a little natural, especially if you're working with, say, a wraith guard, um, because you're going to want to make sure that the stance uh, for his legs feels natural, or something a little bit more dynamic like this uh, war walker where he actually is stepping off of the ground right there and I could have done a little bit more with this pose um, he's angled down like he's moving forward at a nice lope um, but I think it could have been a little bit nicer All right, back to our miniature um, our little clamped piece is more than ready now and uh, we'll go ahead and just drop that on top there. Once again, we'll kind of take a look and see where the flexibility is. It looks like we're going to want him fairly upright. So I'll just do a little circle up here of glue. And then uh, I'm gonna mush it up in there. Make sure it's as straight as I can possibly estimate it to be. And then when you rush, things start to move around. So, and we'll just come and 
Just hold him there for a minute. Give him a little wiggle. And I'll usually let go and see if the pieces support themselves. And uh, there we go. So he is up and will not stand up. Bloop. So he will definitely be glued down at his base. And then the next part here is we'll do his... Uh, maybe we won't do his head just yet. Um, when we go to paint him, we're going to want to get into this area here. Um, I am definitely the worst at following that advice. I love for my models to be assembled and ready and, you know, on the shelf um, and not leave a bunch in pieces. It probably says a lot about having a good workflow um, where you actually, you know, open a box, assemble them just enough, paint them, put them on your dial, do the next box. Uh, and I, uh, I am terrible at that. I just get everything, all the things, and go from there. So I'll just leave his head off right there and lay him down. And now we'll skip ahead here in the instructions to the rest of this. Once again, everything we need should be, um, all the pairs should be on the uh, same um, model here. So we will look at this. We have left arms and right arms. Ooh, I like that long one there. And it looks like we have a set here and a set there. So we'll just grab those pieces. And doing it this way also lets your other parts of your miniature dry um, while you're cutting out the other pieces. That'll be my excuse for doing it this way. Sounds plausible, right? And uh, these are definitely good examples of, you know, seeing a lot of these um, kind of hard to pick up mold lines along the edges there. All right, so we've got these ones cut out. And let's. Um, Take a look at being cleaned up, so we'll just very lightly take some small shavings off that. And then there's a pretty big one on this thumb there. Once again, I'm going to just be very careful. Minimal amounts of force. And this one up here on the uh, bicep. And then I will just shave off those mold lines. A little bit there. And got some going down this one. Alright. Do the other one here. Once again, out. Just too easy. Definitely worth a little bit of practice and um, definitely get good knives and good blades. And also, by the way, the trick um, to, you know, going through after you've cut yourself terribly is to get it cleaned and bandaged and some painkillers in you before the shock wears off. I said that a little facetiously, but only a little. I need to clean off a little of this stuff. Sometimes I lose out on my interest. Sometimes I'm much more obsessive about cleaning up these lines. It all depends on the day. All right, go back to our miniature. Oh, now I see why he's leaning. He's not quite on balance because these middle limbs are what prop him up. So we'll just check where those are appropriate. They are the secondary limbs. So I'll drop some glue in here because I can use their balance to help me position them. So if he's going to be standing like that, probably needs his fist about right there. And I'll just hold this for a second because it's kind of at a weird angle. And I'll probably go on to cutting out and gluing the gun together while one arm sits because these are a little bit heavier pieces. If you're doing Drakari or Space Marines or Astro Militarum, um, the pieces are lighter and they won't need so much set time. Like that guy right there. And when in doubt, um, just uh, find something to prop them up against. There we go. So now he's propped up. I'm sorry that's not in the right direction of the camera. Um, so that his arm can dry with that fist kind of, you know, knurled over on the ground. Uh, so while that's going on, let's cut out the impaler cannon. Which is 26, 29, and 30. Which I've got 26 right there. I want to 
say that I know that the um, Impaler Cannon's better. I don't. I think more that it's just, you know, the shock cannons are a shorter range and have to be in line of sight. And with a Tyranid army, you really use up every last drop of your front line uh, for hand-to-hand -hand combat units. And so it just seems easier. Right, here's the other part of the barrel. Also, when you prop something up, don't use your glue, because you'll be irritated later. have his supporting arm that interfaces with the gun. And that should be all the pieces for that guy right there. Um, all the different opportunities to model these also mean that uh, there's a lot of extra bits. So always have a bits box. And we'll show you a bits box. This is my Dark Elder bits box. And uh, I like this one because the compartments come out. Um, so I've got, you know, guns and weapons in this one. I have extra heads and body parts. I have all of the clear canopies that go on all the jets and the bikes and so forth. And then I have a big old trough of vehicle parts. And um, I think I got this one at either Michael's or Hobby Lobby. It was only about 4 or $5. They really are great. Um, you know, if you don't, you're going to end up like me, and you're going to have just a closet full of boxes with all the parts, which you'll, you'll never touch again. So having a little bits box is definitely great. And whenever you want to do conversions or, you know, have something that you'd like to change or, to, you know, have double characters, like there's only one model that I know of for um, some, you know, commanders and characters. And so if you want to make a few changes to them just to make them stand out and be a little bit different, then having your bits box is really going to make that possible. Continuing right along. This may see, if this is your beginner modeler, this may seem a little tedious. Um, but I think a couple things will become apparent as you go on. Um, one is that you know building the models is a lot of fun. It really is enjoyable, especially if you're buying in limited quantities. Um, you really get to enjoy them as you go along, and it's it's really great. Um, also, uh, once you get to where you're painting them and you're pretty happy with your painting, all those little bits and pieces and flashings and that are hanging on to your model all become really obvious to everyone else who looks at your model. Um, so definitely, you know, it's worth the time. Well, I think I will sneak ahead here and uh, put this other arm on, and now we actually can balance it with the other side. Just like that. So once again, that's why I like this glue. Um, everything from Games Workshop is going to be a bit more expensive. Um, you know, give it a try. You know, when it comes to your budget and tools and materials, a good rule to live by is get the best you can afford. Um, and that really is an important distinction right there. The best you can afford. Don't overbuy if you you know going to end up breaking the bank. Um, just make sure to get good tools, good materials. Um, you'll never be unhappy with a better tool. Um, so always be careful of that kind of stuff. All right, so let's get his gun together, and we're going to dry fit this as well because I think this one actually is going to wrap. Oh. That one is going to go like this. And it looks like it actually wraps around. Interesting. Oh, they're right there. How nice. Um, and this one will go on the outside here. So toothy pieces go on the top. Looks right there. Alright, so let's get some glue wrapped around the shape and where that little tube is going to go. So it goes on the back. 
like that. And just lay that down. We're also going to put some extra glue on the end here so that the pieces all weld together just right. And just kind of make sure it's on there like that. And then make sure it's straight, which, once again, there it is. Um, Definitely, you know, they. if you've been reading about Warhammer or thinking about getting into the hobby, a lot of things, you know, what you'll hear a lot is that Space Marines are really the, um, the beginner entry uh, army. And they are that way for a lot of reasons. Uh, one, they're very good. Um, no matter what role a standard Marine is doing on a battlefield, he's going to be good at it. Um, he'll be above average of another race's kind of tactical, all-purpose warrior. Um, they're very easy to paint and assemble. I mean, they're mostly armor. They're mostly one color, um, and uh, it really makes it easier. They're also a bit smaller, uh, which means they're more expensive on a points-wise and price-wise, usually. Um, so you don't have to collect as many. Uh, I have, I think, three horde armies now. Boy, that was a, a miscalculation. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to put these two pieces together, and something that just will never leave you is when you have to glue your arms on your model, let me get the center back up here, um, when you have to glue your arms on your miniature and they have to support each other in a very particular position. Um, and this can always be a little bit frustrating to get these balanced up, you know, well, do I, do I glue the two pieces for the arm together now and then just kind of open and close them based around the miniature, or do I glue the gun arm on and get it halfway set, and then glue the secondary arm on? Um, I usually follow the latter. Um, I think it's a little bit easier to get things where you want them. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. So be mindful of all the other limbs that are still a little wet. Um, I will take his gun arm here and just kind of position it what it looks like in the picture. Um, and I'll hold on to this one because it's going to be in kind of a weird spot. Whoops. And I push a little hard, and I push the barrel right out of place. And the thing about this glue is it doesn't insta-cure, so it is a bit easier to move things around if there's something wrong, um, or to brace it in your hand. This is too much of a weird angle for this, so my little grippers um, aren't going to work. But I'm just going to put a little pressure on it and hold on to it until I'm satisfied that it's going to stay in position long enough for me to put that supporting arm on. Which is not yet. Sometimes I'll try and juggle it, or I'll just put them on and just wrap my hands around it and hope for the best. There we go, that's looking pretty good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold it in such a way that um, I'm balancing his gun against his body with my thumb and forefingers. Um, and then I'll go ahead and start working on the other side and glue these pieces on for his supporting arm. And this is where it gets a little possibly impossible. And he's still a little bit too wet for me to be around there. Um, you know what I'll try and do? Let's just lay him down and get this positioned. Another good thing to have is a nice pair of uh, wide nose uh, mm, um, these things. And uh, we'll just grab a hold of this and then we can kind of position it with our fat fingers getting in the way. Or a fat band-aid or whatever else is going to get in the way. There we go. So now that's positioned onto the gun barrel there. And, um, can I get up? Let's get this back where it needs to be. Like that. And I think I've pushed him out of shape here, so you're getting to see a nice comedy of errors. And then I'm just going to balance his gun a little bit here. A bit more light there. Um, and 
until it seems like he's doing a little bit better. And I'll kind of use my other fingers to reposition or push together pieces so that he's where he needs to be. Or I'll get bored and I'll try and find something that will hold this up where I want it, like right there. And now what I can do is I can kind of turn the model around and continue to make tweaks to his position and make sure that things are sitting the way I want them to. Um, another good thing about this weld glue is that um, when there's a little bit of a gap, you can kind of carefully use the glue to weld that gap shut, um, which usually works pretty well if it's a thin gap in when you go to paint it or prime it. Um, if not, if it's getting a little bit big, you can give the green stuff uh, a try, um, which definitely I am, I am not a sculptor at all. Um, doing small things and trying to make them match is uh, difficult, so um, just know that it's, it may not be exactly what you want. Just use on small areas and work your way up. Well, that's sitting right there. And uh, now the question is, you know, do I glue him to his base now, or do I paint him? 99.9% um, .9 of the time, I'll just glue him to his base, because I want to have him up on the shelf and ready to go when I get done assembling all my various things, and I want to come back and actually paint him. Um, or if, say I want to go play a game, they're ready to go, I can put them on the table. Um, that can make, more, make things more difficult down the road, um, especially when you're trying to paint different areas, or um, even in this model, you know, what a lot of uh, you know, miniature models would do is they would leave the, the arms out. Um, and get it all painted up, and then paint the limbs separately with, by pinning them all back together again. Therefore, they have exact paint and exact detail everywhere they want it. Um, and I applaud them. I think that's fantastic. I am still working my way up to that particular um, phase, and uh, I'm starting to use my airbrush a little bit more, which is causing me to consider these things quite a bit. Um, having said all of that, I'm going to glue them to his base. Very carefully, just get all these pieces with a dollop of glue on them. And then look to position him as centered as I can on his base. Just like that. And that is that. I will leave the, the head off as I said, to make it easier to do a bit of painting. Um, just to get that area in there kind of shaded before I drop his head in there, or even, you know, paint um, his head separate, which is actually probably going to be the better uh, reward from this. And uh, one thing I'll probably do here as well um, is I will, you know, pin, put a pin in his head so that I can actually hold it and paint the entire head. Um, you can do this. I don't know why I picked up an actual pin. Um, but uh, I use, I've actually cut down some finishing nails, and I'll drill a little hole with my Dremel tool. Maybe we can talk a little bit about that in another video. Um, or I've also got some armature wire I'm trying. It's a little bit easier to work with, and it's a little bit bigger, um, just in case those little uh, drills needed to drill that small hole get too fragile to use those speeds. Um, so there we go. And uh, that's my first video on this channel. Um, if you're interested, you know, please subscribe and like. Um, I'm going to say at the end of the video, because if you got bored by now, don't worry about it. And uh, I'm going to do a lot more videos. Really, this channel is about all of my hobbies. Um, my hobby, therefore, I am. This is all about the things I do. So it'll be miniature, you know, making and modeling and painting. It'll be woodworking. It'll be leatherworking. Um, it'll be gardening and so forth, too. And I'll split those all up by playlist. So really, it's about all the ways that um, I use, you know, different hand skills and learn skills and technologies and tools to do stuff around the house, to do my hobbies, and to uh, um, really, you know, try and do something with those things uh, as a full-time gig. Um, video coming up too soon is we're going to be building a full-scale gaming table um, for the Warhammer 40K. Um, it's also going to have uh, some higher sides on it, it's going to have some players' pockets, and it's going to have a cover that will turn it into just a high gaming table, and then that way for playing other kinds of games, all the boards will just sit over top of the miniature scape. And that'll be a lot of fun. So uh, stay tuned, and thanks for tuning in, and have a great one.